think. Um, I don't know if the interpreters are ready, but I don't speak New Zealand, so I'll, I'll try, to do my, try to do my part, speak slowly. Uh, it, it's fabulous to be here. Um, there's so much going on in the world, and collaboration is key. These issues are too big for us to, uh, to try to manage within a company or within a country, so um, it's fabulous to be here. It's my first time in the Southern Hemisphere, so far it's, it's, been, it's been all right as well. So, um, Now, my presentation um, is food fraud. And so there's two ways to start. Before I get started to talk about some of the, the, the terminology, and, and I have that, actually I'm gonna set my, my timer, because I can go all day if we don't. But uh, um, the key is, intent, if, if you have to choose between intentional or unintentional, then food fraud is an intentional act. So many times that fits under some of your definitions of food defense. But then the response is really more a preventative control. And the FDA just put that under the Preventative Controls Act, which is more food safety. So you've got these kind of conflicting definitions if you have a, a linear definition of it. And we'll show you how, when focusing on prevention, it takes a fundamentally different approach, but it doesn't have to be that big of a deal. So that's a big thing. There's not going to be a separate uh, agency for this. It, it's looking at this risk in the continuum of all food risks. So once we look at them together, you're probably doing 99% of everything you need to do to prevent food fraud already under food quality, food safety, or food defense, audits, inspections, regulations, things like that. It's now looking at it through the bad guy's eyes. Think like a criminal. So um, all I do every day, my wife would say all, all day, um, is food fraud prevention. And it's policy and strategy is where we really focus. It's, and so we don't have a testing lab, but we look at trying to set up and understand how programs should be put in place to prevent. And we're really trying to get in the mind of the bad guy, because think of the bad guy as, as a competitor, business competitor. They're looking at the marketplace and looking for financial opportunities. So just the way you look at a market, do you enter that market or not, they look at the same they, they, the same type of principles. If we understand that, we can disrupt it. So the biological organism in question is not a microbe. If it was, we would naturally go to the field of microbiology. The biological organism in question is a human. So we would go to the behavioral sciences and, and criminology, crime science. And I was actually in the School of Criminal Justice for four years before, before moving back to food safety and fully being involved in, in the food safety approach. Uh, so that's what we do. We have an initiative. Uh, we ha are starting to uh, interact with uh, colleagues here, researchers here in New Zealand and Australia, so you'll hear more about that later. Um, first off, we didn't just sit in Michigan and think we know everything, and, and uh, why don't you just define our research articles. Dissemination of information and teaching is a core of, of, of what we do. So first is a massive open online course. Free, open, online, near infinite capacity, uh, two two-hour webinars, so it's not a big commitment. We offer these twice a year, and this is uh, the seventh and eighth one will be the next year. And in November, it will be bilingual, and the, the Mandarin speakers will be the, the CFSA, China Food Safety Risk Assessment Center. I'm an advisor for them this year, probably next year as well. I spend six weeks a year in, in Beijing with them. It's quite an experience. But, um, so we have this bilingual um, um, uh, program. So if you're looking to learn about food fraud, and it, what's happening globally, this is a great way to start. Feel free if you get an email or see it, post it anywhere. Again, it's, it's, it's open. The second is executive education. So smaller courses to, to help train executives or government people that need something in a shorter, shorter time period. And then graduate courses. All of our graduate programs are online, 100%. These are real Michigan State graduate courses. It's a real Masters of Science but they are 100% online. 80% of our students are working professionals. So they're like you, out in the field. Um, so we have, we have four of these that, that are related to food fraud in one way or another, uh, protecting the product from, from harm. And then if you, if we have a, a, a graduate certificate in food fraud prevention. So if you start to look at, if you're trying to have, uh, help someone in your organization become an expert or, or education, as Frank said, versus training, the education component, we, we put that together in a series of programs and a certificate. And if you like that, all the credits can roll into an online master's in food safety. It's a real, a real master's. And we also, I pointed out on here, is on our website, we have a lot of information. We try to have that be a, a communication portal, and one thing we have is a food fraud reference sheet. 
So we update that with links and videos and things like that. So that's, that's a resource and where we really uh, have our foundation. Now, th one of the things that we've been doing and uh, getting more interest is translation into Chinese or our English articles translated into Chinese. And, and in this case, uh, the first article was introducing food fraud and it was translated into Korean, Russian, and Chinese. And the key with this as well is our co-authors were CFSA, Dr. Yangning Wu, chief scientist for, for that, that center. And so when we work with them on this translation, this becomes a reference document in China because this is coming from a group that, that looks at these topics. The key is harmonization of terms. So we're sharing in other people's cultures and languages these core concepts. Once we find the core concepts, we can move forward on them. So we look at translation by local scholars and food safety experts. And then look at the reference, it to hopefully becomes a reference in, in their, their country. And we, we're continuing to do this for more. We also just finished a, 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 one of our food fraud industry reports on the preventive controls rule, that specifically on food fraud for the US. That's free on our, on our website. And that's being, as you can see, translated in, into Chinese as well for, for reference there. So defining food fraud first. This is a great one single slide. And, oh, our, our website has this PowerPoint. So you can, if you go to the website, you can, you can pull it. And feel free to use this as the definition so if so, or a, a reference slide for you. If you're trying to explain it to someone, this is one slide. First off, it's, it's deception using food for economic gain. Pretty simple. That, that's, that's it. They're using food for this, this, this cheating. Um, and then, then to go down, really to, to look separately, you know, the motivation is economic gain. And that's important when we're trying to disrupt the bad guy. And traditionally, food defense has been harm, large, more large-scale harm. Um, FDA, under the uh, intentional adult, well, they moved, they moved EMA out of intentional adulteration rule, saying that, that the IA rule covered catastrophic events. So traditionally, that's a food defense uh, um, definition. Now, uh, here's a real key. Horse meat did not have a public health threat. So if you're the public health agency, you said, not me. So who, who is it? And that, that's a real key. And the problem we had is that people were looking like this. And the same with testing as well. In the state of Michigan, we have laws that are 20 years old that, that we're supposed to be doing species tests. But when you take a food safety risk-based approach, you would stop doing those tests. Because a food safety risk-based approach is looking at outbreaks. There's no public health threat. So, so they logically, scientifically based, stop doing species tests. We don't need new laws in the state of Michigan for us. We just need to now prioritize that the risk is different. And the key is hazard versus vulnerability. So uh, every time there's a, a food fraud incident, there is an economic hazard. You're, you, the country, the, the, the brand, tax, everybody does have an economic threat from it happening. There's not always a public health hazard such as horse meat, but there could have been. And if the bad guys on the next load didn't put the good horse meat in, or they had a normal you know, thaw, refreeze problem, we would, have, we would have no way to trace it. We didn't know what was in there. So there's always a vulnerability, and that vulnerability is what's really um, um, the, the important piece and what's really um, um, coming with governments to be a, a major problem. And then we give some examples. Sorry, we'll give some examples there, so I won't go into those. But this is a great one slide. Screenshot it, you know, you put it in your PowerPoint. Just leave our, leave our logo in the corner so you can give us some credit there. Um, now, what is food fraud? This is from the Global Food Safety Initiative. What's, what's key about this is that this is the, the type of definition and scope that is being implemented and required of industry. So if you want to sell into GFSI type companies, you will be compliant with this. GFSI under food fraud think tank, I was on the food fraud think tank. Um, they, they, they created this, this um, definition, and they, it's now been stated that the next guidance document will require a food fraud vulnerability assessment and a food fraud mitigation plan. For companies to be compliant with GFSI, not part of GFSI, GFSI, they must do this. So a key is looking at the broad scope of what they covered. And they covered it because it's not only health hazards, it's economic hazards. I can tell you, your, your country knows more than anybody what some of these hazards can, can do to an economy. So it's, it's a, not a raw new it's just being aware of it. But it's all these different type of things that go on around. You wouldn't think of maybe gray market or diversion um, as, as something. That's genuine product. How do you do food authenticity testing on stolen genuine product? Date code tampering. 
So the key is that they cover all these. Those can all lead to recalls and problems in your country. We also added in here uh, overruns and tampering. And up here in this area, this is where FDA in the US is still hasn't redefined economically motivated adulteration. In the Federal Register, they, they define it as a substance for economic gain. So it's still in this area up here. And then um, really all food fraud is, is covered broadly. And this is more common with uh, uh, the UK definition, the, the EU, GFSI, China, with their traditional and non-traditional risks, ISO. And even with the preventive controls rule, uh, we can talk about a day on that. The key is FDA says, whatever the hazard is, we're holding you accountable for preventing it, period. Call it what you want. If there's a hazard, you're accountable. So we're seeing this that generally it's, it's covered in this, this broad frame. So to define it, um, what we did is we were originally working in food safety and food defense, really on the, on the reaction side. Once something occurs, you have, those are kind of the responses for an incident. But we really saw that preventing food fraud was fundamentally different. Because as, as John said too, the bad guys, are, are, they're actively seeking to avoid detection. They're, they're studying what we do. They study GFSI and test methods and, and read every document to try to get around it. So it's fundamentally different from the motivation. And then food quality is important to put in there as well because that's a major cost. And most times these groups report upwards under quality assurance, food quality, a senior vice president of quality. So that, that's where the frame is. On one side, we've got unintentional acts and intentional acts. They know what they're doing. Harm occurs down here for food defense, that's, that's public health, economic, or terror. Someone that's good at food defense will know pretty quickly because people will start dying or they'll tell us. You know, they reveal who, who did it. With food fraud, they're actively seeking to avoid detection. We don't know, they're gonna keep trying to get better and better. Some of the science of what the food of, has gone on with food fraud is absolutely mind-boggling. So the, the goal is economic gain. And a real key is that we can, we can, we can deal with that. And that deal, that's really crime science 101 is situational crime prevention, changing the space of crime so someone looks at your company or country and says, you know what, don't try to do it with their product. You know, we'll probably get caught. And that's the key, we can, we can, we can leverage that. Um, and then overall, to look at, at GFSI as well, um, GFSI has defined this as what, and it's shown up in the EU, the UK, and others as three separate types of assessments. Because HACCP, I, I would never propose we change HACCP to broaden it to the scope, keep HACCP, HACCP, food safety. And then TACCP, or food defense, whether it's carver shock or other things, is a separate, separate uh, um, assessment. And then food fraud needs to be a separate assessment. Not a big deal, but a separate assessment. Because if we use something like carver shock to look at a, a, a food fraud event, it would be very low on the shock factor. Even we had the Tylenol incident in the US, that was uh, eight people died. It was about a billion dollars in loss for Tylenol. That would be a one to two or maybe two to three on the shock scale out of 10. So it would be, it's a great tool, but it would be an ill-fitting tool for food fraud. And let me tell you, horse meat you gotta deal with, right? Those type of food fraud incidents you must deal with, so it's just a different type of hierarchy. And so GFSI is putting this under that, that overall framework and umbrella. A key is that once you have one of these risks defined as high, how do you compare a food safety risk in your countermeasures if it's high compared to food defense or food fraud? So if you're in the decision-making side, resource allocation of a company, this is where you start to get really uncomfortable. Because you've got people in your organization doing these vulnerability assessments, telling you that it's a high. What if you don't deal with it? These people in the front row are going to give you a call and uh, ask you why. The key is now calibrating that across your enterprise. And that can happen. That's not rocket science. This is business 101. Accounting 101 is enterprise risk management. It's a central structure and program that they teach in business schools. There's certifications, programs. It's a way to calibrate risks across an enterprise. And an enterprise could be a company or a country, even, of looking at these risks finite amount of, of resources. And so what we did first is the core is the fraud opportunity. This is crime science, situational crime prevention, the fraud opportunity. So you first look at your own fraud opportunity. It's unique to you, to your country, to you, to your product, to, to maybe even your specific supply chain. You got the victim on one side, you. If you're good at it, if your brand is growing, then every day that goes by, you're, you're a bigger victim. And then you've got the fraudster on the bottom. We say fraudster, not criminal, because it could be um, 
it might not be a violation of a criminal statute. And you know, those law enforcement officers and those attorneys, they're pretty particular. And so if you call something a crime, and they then ask, what criminal statute is a violation of? And you say, well, it's not a criminal statute violation. Eh. You're, you could be out. So a key is fraudster. If civil violation, a violation of a contract, that's, that's fraud. So, so that's that leg of the triangle. The key is, the side we can work on is the guardian and hurdle gaps. Guardians are the forklift driver watching that product come in and all of a sudden see, hey, there's one of those, those uh, bags of frozen meat looks different. To have a way to report that, that variation. And then the hurdle gaps, like hurdle technology and food, is putting then tests in place. In this case, it would be species tests. Make it harder for the bad guy to operate. The way we reduce crime is increase the risk of getting caught and the cost of conducting the crime. You don't have to have your system or country be perfect. You just need to increase the risk of getting caught. They are not just dying to knock off your product. They're, they're patient, and they're looking to make money. So if you just become a bit of a harder target, then you can reduce that. A key with that is that then there's three components here. Detecting. We must be able to detect it, or we don't, we don't know what's going on. Then deter it. Once you know horse meat, you can put tests in place for species of horse. But really, the question isn't just horse meat. It's what else? What's the next horse meat? What's the next melamine? That gets to be preventing your system. And that gets to be truly prevention. So these, these, there's a hierarchy here. With prevention, if the bad guys don't know you're testing for horse meat or anything, all you're going to do is catch them, not prevent it. And contrary to popular belief, the goal is not to catch food fraud. The goal is to prevent it. So you want to actually leak out information about what you're doing. You don't tell them exactly the test or the frequency or where you're doing it, but they should know that you have a food fraud strategy. You have a food fraud center. You have the food fraud network, IRON. They need to know something's going on because first they'll think, oh, I should, I should take a look. It's, it's called anticipatory benefit. That you say you're doing something, the bad guys will hold off. But anticipatory benefit goes away. They'll start looking and they send stuff through to see if that horse meat, how much horse meat gets caught. They might send it to a lab to see how much that lab can, can find. So we want to look at the prevent in, in the, the, uh, the continuum here. So once we look at the fraud opportunity, the next step in what's occurring now is developing these vulnerability assessments. So we need to have a, a harmonized way to look at this, and that's our role as academics as well, with, with the associations, to look at, at how we can present to you a science-based, theoretically sound way to do this new type of assessment, as well as how it fits into the overall system. Once you do the vulnerability assessment, a key is that you, you need to cover all types of fraud, most likely separately. This is not a big deal. If you try to have one model that covers all types of fraud, I mean, we're going to have to bring in the PhDs of uh, you know, mathematics and statistics to figure that one out. Because even theft, cargo theft versus employee theft, each individual risk assessment for those are, are simple, but you put them together in a big model, it gets complex. So there may be a series of these smaller vulnerability assessments that help you look at, at the big picture. It might sound complex, it's really not. We start slowly. But that's the overall vulnerability assessment. And then the, the thing that, that we haven't had in the past, well, we, we get the models, we get the result. What we haven't had in the past is the crossover into the resource allocation decision, priority setting across an organization. This is enterprise risk management. So these basic principles can be put into the ERM system. I've been in numerous client meetings where they say, oh, we don't, we don't have ERM. The next meeting they say, we actually have ERM, but they, you know, they, they didn't tell us. That, that there's some kind of uh, um, adjusted um, decision-making process, but, but truly at the core, ERM is used for Sarbanes-Oxley type uh, um, uh, um, financial reporting. The financial analysts look at it, and, and it's, it's, it's done at that, at that level. And that can be done as well at an enterprise being a country to judge this risk against all other risks. So basically, for us in front of Congress, when Congress says, how big is the problem and what should we do about this, we can compare it to the other, other risks as well. So this is actually, each individual concept is not rocket science. This is criminal justice 101 in the fraud opportunity, accounting 101 in enterprise risk, risk 101 or decision sciences 101 in the vulnerability assessments. And when we look at the countermeasures, it's packaging 101, supply chain 101. The problem is it's about 10 different disciplines that have to come together. And a key that you'll see here, once you go from the, the risk assessment 
the, the red box, and you think about countermeasures, that feeds right back in to the fraud opportunity. It's a cycle in a system. So you have a systems-based approach. It constantly recalibrates itself when you have more information. This is how different is this than Six Sigma, the quality management? It's a system, it's an approach, and it self-corrects. One thing that's been interesting is to look at how this is happening around the world. And I specifically added these because I know that China is a very important uh, customer of yours. So China has been moving forward with their new food safety law. And we were fortunate that, that a team from CFSA came over to the Food Safety Summit. And on that panel also was Queen's University Belfast. I'm a visiting scholar there, so Katrina Campbell came over. Uh, Michelle Lees from Eurofins spoke about GFSI. Uh, Susan Brown spoke about U.S. Pharmacopeia, and that, that worked there. And then Eve Ray, is Dannon, and a number, a number of other, other items. So a group came together to talk about food fraud, and specifically what's going on in China with their laws. And the key to the slide on the right is pointing out that China is using this basic infrastructure or, or hierarchy that looks at all types of fraud. Specifically, so they're talking, this is China's words on the slide. Uh, food fraud incident type, but then they, they're focusing on the, the high public health threats first, and that's adulteration, adulterants, substances, and, and counterfeiting. Um, so that, that's what's going on, and so I've been over a couple times with, with them. Also something that I found very interesting, and, and this I added because I think it adds um, emphasis, um, again, as, as your one of your biggest export uh, uh, customers, and what's happening around the world is, is how China is looking at and taking food fraud prevention, key food fraud prevention, not just detection, very, very seriously. So Zheng Shi Chen, Dr. Chen, was presenting at the Institute of Food Technologists, and I was very excited to hear him talk about the new food safety laws. Um, and the, the key was that I was actually kind of shocked. I'm a food fraud researcher, but shocked that the title of the slide had fight against food fraud. I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty big deal. He's talking about China's food safety law, the new entire law, and he's emphasizing food fraud. So it's important, and they have, they have a number of issues with that, but food fraud is front and center. Also, they, they have the, a food risk matrix there, and funny, those, those colors look even familiar. <laughs> they are properly referenced, but a key is that first article, remember the first article, introducing food fraud with co-authors? Dr. Wu from CFSA is a co-author. So this is months after that article came out. These are common concepts that they're already integrating into their, their terminology, their nomenclature, their system. They're explaining where food safety fits into this overall food risk matrix because it's a common concept that they, that they do understand. Um, also, they, they do point out that a lot is the social aspect of it, uh, a very, very big concern for them. And then this was Dr. Ch Dr. Wu that was at the, um, the Food Safety Summit. And again, similar slide. A key there is he points out how the different food fraud or food safety um, related um, laws and amendments fit under that one hierarchy. And I think this is a, this is a sound way to look, I say, countrywide as well. Food risk matrix, that's that you're responsible for all food risks. And this is a, a way to look at each of those types of uh, structures. Look at what laws are covered in there. A key for you as a country and a company Every food <laughs> risk really needs to fit it clearly into one box. Because if it doesn't, if you just say, not me, not me, then, then, it's, then it's in a gap. And so the person that's accountable for food fraud might not be responsible for implementing every program. But they're accountable for making sure that anti-diversion and things like that are covered. Um, and then they, they, he covered that same, that same definition. So I'd like to say also, um, we consider that a lot of people have been really uh, helpful along the way. Hopefully we'll add more of you. Um, I think uh, one thing that what we've said is that, that uh, I, I consider myself the food fraud librarian. You know, I gather the information and, and you're the books in the library. You know, I've learned a lot already in these, la these next, or these last uh, couple days. Um, so help us gather that information. If you have challenges or questions or evolution, you know, of concepts, communicate with us. We want to write about it. We want to think about it. And only if you really do tell us, at this point, I like this point, I didn't understand, or we're not doing it that way anymore. We need to know that so that we can work it back into the literature, publish on it, and then it's a, it's a science-based resource. So, so please engage with us. And as we grow our New Zealand and Australian footprint, please do that as well. I've got 15 seconds. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all serious. So thank you. It's, it's been interesting. Hopefully, you kind of, if you were on the ledge and worried about this, um, it's something to definitely 
pay attention to, but there's a lot of work going on in the strategy and policy. This, there we go. Step forward, and uh, with that, I will say thank you.